Welcome in to another edition of the Cubs Talk podcast brought to you by Tasty Works. I'm Tim Stebbins, live from Wrigley Field, up near the Catalina Club, and joining me from Wrigley Field, but on the actual field behind home plate is our Cubs insider, Gordon Wittenmeyer. Gordon, how's the view down there? You know, the, Tim, the view would be even better if before they close up that Catalina Club, you could bring me down a cocktail, maybe a double after the long homestand. There's still people in there. There might be a, a, an opportunity yet to uh, to go in there and see what's going on. Dude, just tell them who you are, man. I'll probably give you an arm load of drinks. I got I got my company uh, swag on. I might have to take that <laughs> off to represent uh, in a professional manner. Um, well, in all seriousness, well, I suppose that's one option. <laughs> it's loud in there. Um, well, all seriousness, we're we're here after the Cubs wrapped up their five game series against the Cardinals at Wrigley. Um, it snapped their streak of series wins at five. The Cardinals won eight to three on Thursday. Um, but honestly though, even with the series loss, I mean, winning five of six series and the way this team has kind of gone this year, I think, you know, it's been a pretty good stretch of baseball recently for them. Yeah. Right. Especially, uh, um, when we kind of looked at their opponents and said, well, yeah, so what they're doing a bunch of against, against a bunch of crappy teams. And then they come in against the top two teams in the division and had a good homestand. You know, they played 500 against uh, the teams that have something to play for. Uh, if, I, if I'm counting right, the five-game series really has me thrown for a loop still. I know they won uh, two of those games, had a chance to, to win the series on the last day. Uh, but they, they beat the Brewers in the series. So Yeah, they could have well, swept the Brewers, really, right? I mean, yeah, right. Justin Steele threw a, a great outing and then went to the bullpen and – uh, obviously the bullpen looks different than it did, you know, a month or so ago. And, but, um, he deserved better that game. So yeah, I mean, it's been positive signs. I'd say, um, that the bullpen thing reminds me of, um, actually I'll go for, I'll go here first. We, we, we got to touch on Albert Pujols, Yadier Molina, right? I mean, this was their, oh man, yeah. the retirement oh, tour, <laughs> and, uh, hit Wrigley yeah, Field this man. week. And look what Pujols did in the, in the opener, right? They get a great pitching performance. And then from the guy they, they traded uh, to, to get from the Yankees, uh, uh, Jordan Montgomery, who who shoved against the Cubs at Yankee Stadium as a Yankee, and then first chance as a Cardinal, does it again, uh, eight innings this time, scoreless. And then what does Pujols do? He hits his, what did we say it was? His 50th? No. His four, how many home runs does he have? His 30th home run at Wrigley? 30th home run at Wrigley, 58th against the Cubs in his career to win a one nothing game to start the series off. So, you know, kind of a kind of a one of those what a way to go out kind of things for an all time Cubs foil, whatever you think of him, however many times you boot him over the years. And we're talking about a Hall of Famer and one of the greats, you know, right up there with Willie Mays and Mike Schmidt and Hank Aaron and those guys who've been a thorn in the side of the Cubs, you know, for an entire career, minus the whatever it was, eight years he spent in uh in uh anaheim um so yeah they, him and molina out the door this year the last game at wrigley and uh, the cubs gave him <laughs> part of the scoreboard um and i guess that's better than uh you know when pujols breaks the scoreboard but uh it was it was kind of weird but uh it, it, at the same time i mean both those guys could wind up being hall of famers it, it's a surreal uh, ending to the series yeah, you know, Pools was spraying the ball all over the place. I think if he was more in his prime, he would he would have got a couple extra base hits just because I think he crushed one that deflected off the wall, but they got it back in quickly. And uh, yeah, that was, was uh, just... his hardest hit of the series, right? Crushed one straight off the wall, laser beam gets a single. It's yeah, a, just a and single, a, and and winds up with two other doubles and uh, a home run. Yeah, what did you think about the? Uh, kind of the honoring the ceremony they did like we said you said uh they give him pieces they give him and uh yadi molina a number from the scoreboard five and four their jersey numbers david ross presented pools the five and uh jason hayward the former cardinal gave yadi molina the number four i thought that was cool just because hayward played there but i did think it was funny and even their twitter account the cubs twitter account kind of made light of this like you can you know respect i guess rivals and what they've done but honoring them is kind of an interesting thing and like the Cubs Twitter account said to two fierce competitors, Roberto Clemente award winners with accolades to spare. We can't say we'll miss you. You tormented us for two decades to earn this honor. 
Uh, I don't think it's a big deal, but I do think it's kind of interesting and kind of feels funny that they're honoring them, I guess. But maybe that's just yeah. the to me. Yeah, I didn't have as much problem with it as Cubs Twitter did, obviously. Um, I don't know how I would have felt if I, if I'm, you know, like a diehard Cub fan who watched all the damage these guys did against my team over the years. Um, but, you know, one thought about it, you know, the, you mentioned the Roberto Clemente award winner thing. Uh, Pujols is universally respected as a good human being in the game too, by everybody. And I think that the, that element of it is part of this, right? Like if he was a dick, I don't think either one of them get, honored before this game here um and obviously it's different than when Derek Jeter remember when Derek Jeter came in final year of his career everybody was honoring him I think they even honored him at Fenway Park but it just so happened that the Yanks were playing interleague uh, uh games against the Cubs that year at Wrigley and the Cubs did a bunch uh, of stuff for him that's different because he hadn't done anything for you uh, or against you over the years he's just a great player happens to be coming through town so I understand why fans, why a segment of the fans are upset. On the other hand, because he's considered such a good dude and a, and a classy human being, it was kind of a classy thing for the Cubs to do. And whatever you might think of Yachty, and I'm not saying Yachty's a bad guy. He's just got a little more of a kind of a kind of an edge that makes him that rub some people the wrong way, maybe here and there. But you're going to honor both if you're going to honor one. So it's it, kind of a classy gesture by the Cubs. Uh, on the one hand, you know, so I don't have a lot of problem with it. I was wondering, I was trying to think about it, whether the the Cardinals would maybe do something similar for players and the Cubs in similar positions. But I was also realized, like, when might that be the case where someone like someone of the Cubs would be around long enough as Pujols and Yachty <laughs> have with one team? Because the, really those guys were all traded and signed elsewhere this winter. So I don't know when the next comp like that would even be. Right. I mean, would Sammy have been that guy? Sammy, Sammy's not welcomed back by the Cubs. So obviously not. And he didn't finish his career with the Cubs. And, and, and there's all, all of that baggage. But yeah, you're right. It would have been Rizzo or it would have been Brian. It would have been Javi. Um, maybe it would have been Schwarber if, he, if he's the guy that were to stick around instead of getting, you know, non-tendered uh, a year and a half ago. So, right. Who is that guy? I don't know. Is it Nico Horner someday? You know, maybe. maybe I don't know. I mean, you tell me, is it Ian Happ someday? The guy that debuted at Bush Stadium and hit a home run in his first game? Uh, I don't know. I mean, he's he'll be a free agent after next year if the, if the Cubs don't uh, decide to sign him. And, and even if they do, is he going to have the kind of career that these other guys have? I don't know. I mean, exactly. I mean, you asked, that's the question, right? The question you asked. Who, who would even be that guy? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's any uh, comps. Um, did they well, do it with – do we know if they did it with Ernie? I don't know. I have to look that up. I mean, I don't know what Bush Stadium, what could compare. Like, the Wrigley scoreboard number is such a classic, easy go-to move for stuff like this. I don't know what the Cardinals could do for something like that Give or what a, they would yeah. do. A big, huge can of Bud? I don't know. <laughs> a ride on the horses, right? On yeah, right. right. Give, him a, give him a Clydesdale and a, and a six-pack. <laughs> yeah. um, well, all right. Well, looking ahead then. Before the series finale with the Cardinals, we uh, caught up with Jed Hoyer, um, who was kind of around today. The Cubs' first and second round picks from the draft last month, Kate Horton, Jackson Ferris, were at the park, and Jed was out there as well. And, uh, you know, not who? this weekend. Who? <laughs> who? Hey, we, no, that's my, that's, no, no, that's my Horton. Here's a who. Anyway, go ahead. Oh, you know, I'm going to shout out uh, Tony and Drackey. Uh, Tony and Drackey had a funny tweet where he's, he kind of combined the Ferris Bueller's day off with uh, Kate Horton, here's a who. So uh, go check that out because uh, that was clever. And there you go. Yeah, Tony, here's a boo. <laughs> well, uh, we caught with Jed and looking ahead, not this weekend, they're playing Milwaukee this weekend. They're going to go to Toronto uh, series after that. And Jed said uh, the Cubs are going to be likely without three or four players, obviously, you have to be vaccinated to enter Canada, and if you're not, you are not allowed to go play in series against the Blue Jays. Uh, so what I guess, what are your initial thoughts on that? <laughs> well, okay, so what were the big stories this year on that? It They were that the Yankees, a division opponent of the Blue Jays, are fully vaxxed, including Rizzo, the guy that got all the headlines last year for not being vaxxed, that the Cardinals, when they went to Toronto, 
sidelined their top two players, Arenado and Goldschmidt, because they weren't vaxxed, and they still went up there and won a game. I think they only played two. They, I think they split that series. And the Kansas City Royals, when they went to Toronto, had like 10 guys on the restricted list because they weren't vaxxed. And two of those guys wound up getting traded and vaxxed because their teams were in the playoffs and potentially could face the Blue Jays. So they wound up getting vaxxed anyway, which was kind of a weird thing. Um, so as, as these things go, my, my thoughts are, I can't imagine the Cubs having one player that I can think of who would merit that, that level of headline. Maybe not a headline at all, honestly, because we know some of the guys like Happ and Horner, and some of the more prominent guys, Wilson Contreras, uh, Marcus Stroman, are vaxxed. They've told us that. Um, and so the, the guys that aren't are going to be, you know, secondary players anyway, maybe a bullpen guy or two, uh, maybe a bench guy. I don't know. We don't know yet. We'll probably find out Sunday morning. Um, and then the other thing is, and Tim, you and I talked about this before. Look, man, I think this is an important thing. I also think that in our, in our, in our culture, in our society, we have such a short attention span. There's a lot of people who uh, hate the subject in the first place because they just think it's been, you know, uh, overplayed. I disagree with that. Um, and then people who don't seem to know the science behind this stuff get all the, uh, you know, up in arms about, well, the vaccines don't even work. Well, yeah, they actually do work, but uh, that doesn't mean you're not going to get the virus. Um, and I think that people are probably tired of hearing about this, right? I mean, there's even people that think like you and I that have a lot of this COVID and vaccine fatigue when it just comes to some of the reports, unless it's a breakthrough in a new technology with these vaccines or, you know, we got, I think there's going to be some more boosters coming out soon, things like that or whatever the latest variant is. But beyond that, man, it's a, it's a fatiguing story. Is it not? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, it's been around the third year of this. And if, from our perspective, like if we're talking about in a baseball sense, it's the third year of this. And I think we've kind of seen, uh, how you know baseball like the world at large has kind of gone back to some normalcy i guess so in a way it's like not to say it's not as important as it was two years ago but you know as something that's i guess breaking news 24 7 it's obviously not that anymore not to say not to take anything away from it um and if i'm honestly from a cubs perspective if we're for being honest like the team that has played had you mentioned it, Paul Goldschmidt and Nolan Arenado not go to the Toronto for that series. That's a big deal. And I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head what the Cardinals did that series, but with where the Cubs are, man, okay, so they split it. With where the Cubs are, I mean, like respectfully, right? Like they're they're 15, 20 games under 500. If you're talking about from a baseball standpoint and being at a disadvantage competitively, if by chance we don't know who these three or four players are, it's guys that are you who you'd want in your lineup or on your pitching staff well with where this team is yeah it's not going to make an impact like it would the cardinals who still wound up as you said just now split that series anyway so from a cubs perspective it's interesting but it's obviously not to say it's not still important it's just it's a different situation i think yeah the more interesting stuff or the more pertinent stuff going forward probably out of the jed stuff would be things like what he talked about with the off season right like um he mentioned uh yeah, I wrote I wrote something earlier in the series about uh, I, I talked to Hap and Horner and Wilson all about how the last core nobody uh, basic basically uh, the the big guys at the end didn't get extended and they tore the core up. Um, they got another core potentially coming, and and this is all in the context of what the Atlanta Braves did, right? They they're talking to Dansby Swanson right now. If they get him signed. I believe that'll be the fourth guy this year, fourth guy this year extended and sixth overall in the last two or three years. Cause remember uh, Ozzy Albies and uh, uh, Ronald Cunha Jr. Uh, both re-upped in uh, 19 at very early points in their service time. And the last guy that they signed to an extension was Michael Harris, the, the rookie who's, who's like had about 70 games in the big leagues. So um, it just shows you how aggressive they are. They've got a core that won the World Series last year, by the way. Harris wasn't on that team. Uh, Matt Olson wasn't on that team. He was one of the guys that got extended. But these other guys were, and they've got them. Shoot, they've got potentially six of them, including their entire infield. 
potentially locked up on long-term deals. So could the Cubs do that? You know, Ian Happ seemed to think that with him not getting traded, he might be back in play this this offseason for at least an exploring contract talks. I think he's right. Nico Horner for sure is going to get attention from the front office uh, in contract talks. I don't know how you don't do that. At least see where you're at with him and what he might need and whether it makes any sense to do it going forward. He proved a lot this year, and the season's not even over yet. Listen to Travis, I think he becomes a free agent. If everything falls a certain way, could he come back? I suppose he could, but that's kind of the long shot that the other guys were last year, too. And so I don't see that happening. Um, but could they do with this, whatever they think their next core is, could they, could they do with some semblance of what the Braves have done? And Jed didn't give us any rock solid answers on specifics, but he said, he did say absolutely that's in play, that they have identified some guys that they think are in that next core. And that is something that they would look at. They have guys that they that they've already got in mind that they might like to look at extensions with and so we know they talked to all the other guys in the last core and they didn't get it done will they get it done this this time i don't know will they be more aggressive about it will they be more aggressive early take a few more risks early i don't know i think they might though i think this could be part of the next core blueprint and that was interesting to hear especially in the context of what jed and Tom Ricketts have said here recently about being more aggressive this offseason and maybe even spending more. That could be in-house as much as it's out in the free agent market. Well, it should be both. I mean, at some point, I'm, let's talk about this. You have to extend your – you have to start extending guys you're developing and churning out. I mean, Hendricks and David Bode are the only two guys that really you can say got – and we know Rizzo early on. I know Castro. But okay, like, hey, wait. Let me, let me ask you this right now. Is is Bodie the reason you hesitate? Is Bodie the reason that you don't get aggressive if you don't have to with some guys? Because now that his contract is where you're actually paying him a little bit of money, he, he starts making $5 million a year on the back end of this deal. He's not a $5 million a year player. It shouldn't be. I mean, he was an 18th round pick, and I'm talking about Nico Horner and Ian Happ were first-round pick all-star type guys. So guys like that with those profiles, you should – you should be doing this and you should be trying and uh, not doing it, I think is. Well, kinda... they're also going to want more. That's fine. But I, I think at some point like this, it, it was, look, the results are the results. And I think you can say outcome bias, like maybe you don't want some of those contracts that those guys from the X core wound up getting. But I think the fact that they didn't extend one of those, name whoever guy from that last contention window there's got to be some level of failure there to not do that and we know we could say now well those contracts would look this way or they would look good or bad but i think if you're turning out as much talent as they have did and you had nothing to show for it some of it at the end your own doing but before that like you said they were they they were in talks with some of those guys and they didn't extend any of them that can't that can't be what you do your whole time as an organization you should be wanting to retain some of your homegrown talent and especially when it. especially when you've got the resources to do it like only a handful of teams do when the yankees want to keep a guy they keep a guy when dodgers want to keep a guy they, they keep a guy now we've talked about this on previous podcasts dodgers also let Corey seager go but they backfilled with a trade for trey turner and now mm -hmm. we'll see what they do with shortstop now that trey turner is a free agent this year do, do they do they go all in to bring him back do they go to into the market to find somebody else? Because they don't have anybody uh, of anything close to either one of those guys' caliber to plug in that's already in-house. But they've got the resources. They're not afraid to use it. And the Yankees, same thing. Maybe Judge goes away. But this is a team that went out and got CC Sabathia when he was winning Cy Young Awards. Garrett Cole when he was in his prime. Um, it, it, go, go down the list. They, they, I mean, they hell, they traded – they traded for Rizzo, and then they, ex then they extended him on a two-year deal. Uh, and, that, and that's just a, a, a small example of the things that they've done. If Aaron Judge goes away because he wouldn't accept the Yankees' mega bucks, they'll apply that mega buck somewhere else. The mega bucks don't go away. They just go to a different player. And that'll be really interesting to see how that plays out. The Cubs should be closer to that than even the Braves. So I'm with you. They have no excuses. If the same thing happens with the next core, whatever that core looks like, because it's not anything close to being put together yet, as what happened to the last core, and those guys wind up going, 
while they're still in prime productive years and they're gone, then, then that's a, that's a multi-level failure of the organization. Uh, is there anything else with Jed you wanted to talk about? Cause I had one more final thing to hit home, maybe to wrap it all up. Well, this isn't so much Jed, but it's kind of along the same lines of what we're talking about. Cause we talk about how Contreras would be, uh, probably gone as a free agent. Um, I, I, I don't think we expected him to be traded. He expected him to be traded. Almost everybody in baseball expected him to be traded at the deadline. And Juan Soto comes in and kind of, kind of, kind of throws a wrench into that market. And the Cubs didn't adjust to make a trade happen. Kept the price on him high. Didn't trade him. Now they'll give him a qualifying offer. He's almost certain to turn it down. Go into free agencies and see what he can get coming off his best season. I think that depending on where the market falls, I think there's a narrow window of opportunity there where if the market falls just right and the price point comes in where the, 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 the Cubs with the, you know, their, their eminent uh, computerized wisdom decide that it is, that, you know, that, that he's worth, uh, that could happen. Um, but I don't think that'll happen. I think there's teams like the, the Mets and, by the way, the Cardinals, who will be big fits with some money to spend, and go after uh, Contreras. Cardinals checked in on him at trade deadline time. Um, uh, I don't think anything got really far there, but uh, they've never signed a guy attached to a qualifying offer as a free agent before. Of course, they haven't gotten really super deep on free agents in general. Um, it's not a philosophical deal breaker for them. Um, and by the way, the qualifying offer costs the signing team far less now than it did prior to the new CBA. And it's possible, depending on where things fall with who's in, who pays revenue sharing and who receives and the whole thing, uh, we don't need to get in the weeds on that. Cardinals could conceivably be a team that doesn't have to give up a pick for a guy like that too. So we'll see where all that, where all that falls at the, at the end of the day. But I think, be careful what you asked for if you're Jed and the Cubs that allowed this to happen uh, where they're at right now, instead of say, making a deal happen at less than you were asking for with, say, the Mets. Because what if Wilson Contreras winds up on the other side of this rivalry next year for, for four more years, uh, five more years? I think that you just spoke the nightmare of Cubs fans onto this podcast. <laughs> if you, right? Cubs, Cubs fans hate Yadier Molina. Okay, let's just call a spade a spade. Cubs fans hate Yadier Molina. And all of a sudden, his replacement is the guy that you love more than any cub, probably, or as, as much as any cub, and as much as any cub in the last half decade. Oh my God! You just—I don't know if you can describe a worst case scenario for fans, and like uh, it's the Cardinals, right? Like at that point, there's no conflicting feeling. It's like you—you you can't like you probably don't like Wilson Contreras the same way, at least if that's what happens. And plus, the, the 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 style of player Wilson is, the emotion that he brings to the field, the passion that he brings to the field. And, and, and uh, how hard he plays, he's the guy you want on your side. He's the guy you love if he's on your side. He's the guy you hate if he's on the other team. And so it's really interesting to see because this guy that has shown so much emotion, so much love for this place, these fans, this organization, if that were to happen, he's got this fairly deep-rooted place in a lot of people's hearts around here. How, how how uprooted does that get if he winds over winds up over there and the Cardinals stay good for 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 the few more years that he's over there and he's a productive part of keeping the Cubs down keeping the Cubs out of the playoffs keeping the Cubs in a wild card instead of a division title things like that right I mean <laughs> I mean these are all these are all domino effect byproducts sometimes that 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 uh, that wind up happening in the larger picture over time uh, when uh, when again when some of these dominoes start falling in baseball it's it's fascinating to think of and man honestly uh it's such a good fit as we sit here right now going in if we if the off season were to begin tomorrow free agency were to begin tomorrow i would see just off the top of my head the mets and the cardinals right there for him yeah i mean i could see Definitely other teams too, but the Cardinals, it's it's the one you wouldn't think of off the top of your head maybe immediately. And then when you actually sit down for five seconds and think about it, it's like, oh, yeah, that would make a lot of sense. By the way, let me throw one more thing at you. 
and just uh, based on a couple of conversations I've had along the way, what's the thing that we say is maybe the reason the Cubs have been lukewarm at times with him or that, that has been a big criticism with him? Game calling. Game calling. The fingers, right? Uh, or the push button these days. That's not something that that uh, the Cardinals would hesitate on. If, if they don't like it, they've got such a system in place, they'd call pitches from the bench. They, they'd, and, and by the way, uh, Contreras, for whatever you might think of him in that regard, uh, is, a, is a student of his staff and, and, a, and a guy that plugs into the system. So if that's their system over there, or if they, if they run meetings a different way when they're preparing for an opponent, he'll plug into whatever that is. Uh, I don't think that that is something that would dissuade the Cardinals from being one of the top teams interested in him at all. I agree. Um, one more thing I think we should, we should hit on, um, as kind of we expected, Kyle Hendricks will – uh, not return this season. He's got the tor- uh, tear in his shoulder. I think it's described as a capsular tear. I've not mm-hmm. heard of that before. I'm not a doctor. I don't know what that means. I have two torn shoulders myself, and I don't know what a capsular tear is. So, uh, That's because you need to go to the doctor. You, you need to actually go to the orthopedist and get your get your stuff diagnosed and fixed, dude. I have, I have diagnosis. I got rotator cuff and labrum and labrum. There you go. <laughs> torn. <laughs> so you know uh, rotator cuffs and labrums there. Yeah, and I know they're I know they're torn. Um, but Hendricks, right? Like I think you kind of wrote about this, but that makes twenty twenty three pretty big for him. He's not going to be back this year, and when uh, he was pitching this year, he struggled. Um, whether that's related to the injury, he struggled, and really last year after a really strong stretch for a couple months, he finished pretty poorly, and uh, his ERA went up. So, as you kind of wrote though, like last guaranteed year of his deal is next year. And with this volume of pitching the Cubs are developing, you know, he's got to get back in form next season. Yeah. We, we don't know what the front end of this batch of pitchers, this wave of pitchers wave, whatever you want to call a wave in the, in the context of Cubs player development uh, when it comes to pitching, but they do, have, they do seem to have volume. That's a double A and triple A. And some of them have already debuted. Um, not to mention the Keegan Thompsons and Justin Steeles of the world who have already established themselves as big league pitchers um, and and should be established going forward, barring any sort of health setbacks. What the front end of that looks like, who knows? Um, but they do have volume, right? And so, so where does Kyle Hendricks fit? Um, it makes you wonder if, number one, in the short term, if they were to go out and get a frontline starter, how competitive would they be right away? Now, the right starter who stays healthy, who's a good, uh, diverse type arm compared to what they've already got, um, power pitcher, ideally, maybe it's a big difference maker. But it also takes the pressure off Kyle Hendricks from having to be that guy as he comes back from the injury and he's later in his career. Kyle Hendricks, as a healthy, productive uh pitcher similar to what he's been maybe not quite as elite as he was in 2016 but maybe half a notch below that a notch below that could could slot in in the middle to back into your rotation really nicely and do you trust this guy in a postseason of course you do i mean whatever he's got he's going to bring in the postseason too and he's going to be competitive and so so there's that the big thing is coming off of this injury and this is this is part of the reason although it's eminently logical, right, that you wouldn't push him to come back soon just to pitch this year. But but part of the reason there's no reason to get him 100% healthy, get him on a throwing program in the offseason where he's getting back at the strength by the time spring, spring training starts, and then bring him in and get him full strength going into the season and healthy. Now, right, it's a huge season. Last year, the guaranteed deal, they do have an option for one more season at I think 16 million is 14 million next year. So neither of those is break the bank numbers for the Cubs come in next year. If he, if he shows, if he shows that he's back to good health and, and, and production. Now you start talking about, do you make this guy a Cub for even longer? He's certainly willing to discuss uh, another contract extension. Probably won't take as much as the last one took to sign him uh, 55 million for, five years or something along those lines. And so, 
He's very affordable. He's a reliable guy. He's a guy that can mentor young pitchers. But he said it. I've got to prove that. I've got to go out and produce for, for any of that to happen. And so 2023 as an individual storyline maybe is no bigger than, than, than it is as it relates to Kyle Hendricks, right? I mean, I just spent way too much time talking about that. But what's your take on that? No, I mean, I agree with that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you summed up well. I think all I would add is, to be clear, I didn't make this clear up front, is uh, it's not going to be – there's no – they haven't discussed surgery. He's not going to get surgery. And he uh, he estimated when we talked to him earlier this week, it's about the shoulder issues halfway healed. And uh, he hopes to start throwing by the end of the season, meaning, you know, starting a throwing program in, you know, the season ends in October, right? So start – heading into the off season, not before the off season and coming back. He hopes to start throwing heading into the off season to really uh, have no concerns during the winter and get to kind of prepare for the season next year as normal. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. And all well, that's good. All of that's positive science for him. And, you know, he's another guy that the fans love and, and for good reason. I mean, one of the things about the, their last core and honestly, some of the guys they put in that clubhouse these days, they're good dudes. Most of these guys are good dudes. And uh, and he he is as much as any of them. So uh, uh, the value of having him around for some of the next young wave that's coming in is potentially pretty big. All right. Well, that puts a wrap. I